Why don't we get started with our first Tuesday? So uh, our speakers are here and uh, welcome everyone to our October uh, first Tuesday. And it actually is the first Tuesday of October. We have two excellent presenters today, uh, Emily Gratchik and Blue Edgy Boye. And um, we'll, we'll move on with them in just a second. I just wanna remind everyone we're working on the FES Center renewal. Um, we had a great retreat uh, last week, was it? Last week? Boy, anyway, um, that was very helpful to me. And I, I have some homework that I need to do to get out uh, to, to people. Um, we're going to do a survey of all the uh, principal investigators about their research areas and technical areas, uh, clinical areas. That will be forthcoming uh, shortly, I understand. And... Um, we're going to schedule individual uh, discussion groups for the various research thrusts. I've tentatively asked, well, not tentatively, I've asked a number of people to help gather information for the, uh, the, the five thrust areas. When I say gather information, I mean talk to other investigators and make sure that we include everyone and that we have a a good coherent story for each of these areas. These areas, again, are movement restoration, pain mitigation, autonomic function, autonomic restoration, um, brain health, and uh, translation and clinical dissemination. Um, the last one is new. Uh, it reflects a, a important uh, change in the way the VA thinks about <laughs> uh, translation so we're we're going we're putting our best foot forward there um if you haven't heard from me yet doesn't mean i'm I, I i have quite a few people i still need to contact but if you're interested in participating in writing the basically the the plan for these areas uh, feel free to let me know that you know this is not ex in any way exclusive we're trying to be as inclusive as possible um it's just been busy lately so um Anyway, don't forget, we're doing uh, strategic planning and discussions uh, for, the, for our renewal, and uh, it's going to have some significant impacts uh, on the, uh, the, you know, the way we spend our budget and things like that. So I hope you can all join in. So without further ado, let's, let's move on. Baloo, are you, Emily indicated you might be going first. Yeah, so I think Emily has more of a presentation. Um, I have a couple slides just to start a discussion, but I think I'll just give a couple slides and Emily will actually do the more of the presentation and then we'll have a discussion, a joint discussion afterwards if that's okay. Okay, yeah. so take it away. All right, um, are we allowed to share? Yeah, let me see. Yeah, I think uh, Eric, I made you guys uh, in okay. charge here. Um, does that work? Is everybody seeing the screen? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I think you've seen a lot of this before in terms of like knowing, hearing about our rehab clinical trial. So I'm not going to belabor too much of the details of the clinical trial. Um, I'll reintroduce them. Um, actually, what we're hoping, you know, and then Emily, as you said, a longer talk about some of the work she's doing in terms of understanding sensory percepts, both in the periphery and the brain. But ultimately, we actually hope to have a discussion about um, ethics, bioethics, um, of the work that we are planning, um, and then maybe lar more, you know, largely speaking, bioethics of the work that we're doing generally in, you know, in relation to neuroprosthetics. Um, actually, I sent an email. Uh, earlier today to Paul Ford. So Paul, I'm glad to see you here and look forward to you know, your input in this, in this as well. Um, but as many of you know, you know, I've been working with Bob many years and a number of other uh, collaborators. I think Bill Member is on here as well and Jonathan Miller, I don't know if he's here. Um, essentially working to um, uh, reestablish connections between the peripheral, uh, peripheral motor control um, and cortical function by combining brain computer interfaces, using them as a user interface to interact with uh, FES systems to restore 
uh, reaching and grasping. Uh, many of you know our previous work with Bill Kochevar that we were able to show um, simple but useful restored functionality directly controlled by brain function to have a person with chronic tetraplegia be able to restore the ability to grasp, feed himself, et cetera, et cetera. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, with Jonathan Miller as the clinical sponsor PI, uh, we established a clinical trial called Rehab, Reconnecting Hand and Arm to the Brain. Um, all credit goes to the illustrious Dr. Kirsch for coming up with that wonderful acronym. Um, and this project or this clinical trial moves the, moves, uh, the ball forward or moves the needle forward or whatever the analogy is um, in two regards. Uh, so the first is on the peripheral side, we are actually moving away from using intramuscular electrodes for, for peripheral activation and moving towards using multi-contact nerve cuff electrodes. Um, you know, D Dustin Tyler and his group have developed over many years um, C-fine based electrodes, which have 16 channels for presumably and hopefully selective activation um, and selective activation of individual functions. So, you know, our goal is to use uh, implanted nerve cuffs with uh, percutaneous leads to perform activation of reaching and hopefully dexterous grasping. Um, specifically, uh, we have a you know, we have a grant focused on restoring individual finger movements and, you know, highly dexterous grasping as well. Um, on the brain side, we are also looking to move the ball forward. Um, previously, we were recording from essentially a single uh, site in primary motor cortex, what's known as the hand knob area, which contains information related to reaching, some grasping, et cetera. Um, we've done two things, so we are planning on doing two things um, in this new approach. So one is that we're actually recording from many different areas of the brain, so not just primary and premotor areas. Uh, we're actually looking at recording from more frontal areas, which may have different qualities, qualities of information, not just movement execution, but potentially movement planning as well. Um, so what this means is that practically instead of implanting two arrays, in the brain as we did previously, we're going to be implanting six mini arrays. So we're going to be looking at implanting in up to uh, you know, six different sites, if you will, of sensory motor cortical areas. And again, the, our working hypothesis is that essentially information from each of these sites will provide, us, will provide us different quality of information for producing a better motor control. Um, additionally, in the brain, and this is actually completely new for us, we're actually looking at not just recording uh, cortical activity, we're actually looking at the ability to write information back into the brain. Um, sensory feedback is something which is cr really critical for, uh, or, or bidirectional uh, feedback is, bidirectional activity is really critical for the ability for persons to, to perform um, activities of daily living. Um, currently, persons with high cervical spinal cord injury, they are limited in terms of how we can give them sensory feedback. Um, there's been some very preliminary work in the field showing that you can use intracortical microstimulation. Actually, let me advance my slides. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of, there's been some work, preliminary work in the field, not a lot by any stretch of imagination showing that by directly stimulating parts of somatosensory cortex, S1, you can give percepts of touch. And so we want to explore this as well, um, being able to use ICMS to restore sensation of grasping, of object interaction, um, and the like. Um, this is something new that we're doing, and this is where Emily uh, comes in, um, in terms of you know, her you know, wealth of experience in terms of doing similar things and amputee populations using peripheral nerve stem. Um, so this is something new we're working on. Um, but, you know, so I think Bob, maybe in previous talks, has explained this very broadly. Um, you know, this is also a platform, not just, you know, there, there's, a sec there's a secondary goals as well. Um, one major goal is obviously enhancing or furthering the neuroprosthetic goals. But, you know, this platform of using BCIs and human participants also gives us an opportunity to learn things about the, about the brain or, or understand things about uh, sensory motor control or how, or how uh, sensation is actually encoded 
in, in the activity of, of neurons um, in somatosensory cortex? Or how do neurons change their behavior as people are learning novel tasks, right? So this is really a potentially a, a unique platform for exploring questions related to sensory motor control and sensory motor learning. Um, the question is, and one thing that we're actually thinking about now as we're preparing uh, new grants in relation to the BRAIN initiative, is what are the ethics of doing so, and specifically of using human participants in exploring these questions related to sensory motor you know, learning and, and, and integration. Um, Emily and I and a number of other people are working to put together a grant with some external collaborators focused on understanding sensory motor encoding and learning. And we're positing using participants who are already implanted as part of our clinical trial, but then also potentially recruiting new participants to receive um, intracortical arrays to allow us to explore some of these you know, questions, um, some of which Emily may touch on in her, in her talk as well. So, you know, I, th I think after Emily gives her talk, we'd really like to maybe figure out or talk about what are these ethics, mostly because we have to address this in our grant. Um, these grants are reviewed not just by scientific reviewers, um, but the science itself is reviewed, but also, you know, there is an ethicist on every, on every panel, or multiple ethicists on every panel, who will end up reviewing the ethics of the science we're proposing um, to, to see whether or not it may, it's, it's um, you know, ethically justified. So, you know, maybe after Emily's done, we could jump back to that specifically. Um, and then with that, maybe I'll give the floor to, to you, Emily. Sure, thanks, Blue. Um, there you go. I was like, I was going to ask you to switch it over. Um, one second. Are you guys able to see this? Let me start sharing. Can you see this? Yes. Yep, great. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Happy to be here and presenting to the FES Center first Tuesdays. Um, I'm also really pleased to be joining the rehab team um, that Blue, you know, briefly outlined there. Um, but my background is in peripheral nerve stimulation uh, to restore sensation, and so it's a transition now to go into, um, you know, brain stimulation, but still investigating kind of similar ideas. Um, so I'm I'm really interested in investigating. Um, this kind of translation, this interface between peripheral nerve stimulation and brain stimulation. Um, so I'm interested, I want to talk, tell you today about some of my recent work in peripheral nerve stimulation and what I think this can maybe teach us about brain stimulation and ways to approach it in the rehab project, and also potentially ways that the brain stimulation recording capabilities in the rehab system could help us learn something about peripheral nerve stimulation. It could go both ways. Um, but again, I think you know, this underlying current of the ethics of using these implanted systems um, in individuals with um, neurological disorders um, to help us understand scientific, you know, truths about the nervous system, um, you know, kind of goes throughout that. Uh, so here's the same image <laughs> that Blue had. Let me see if it'll, maybe, there we go, no, sorry. Okay, so here's our system <laughs> over on the left. We're going to have FES implants and brain implants as well. And I want to point out that the brain implants and somatosensory cortex is what I'm focusing on here. Um, and these will be placed in area one, which is in the postcentral gyrus. Um, we've been working with collaborators at Johns Hopkins to help us develop techniques for intraoperatively placing these arrays in the fingertip regions of the cortex. And um, they, that group, as well as several others, have been successful in previously acquiring um, fingertip and hand areas of, of sensory feedback using intracortical microstimulation in humans. So there've been a number of studies in non-human primates over the years, but in recent years, there's been three different groups across the country who've been able to demonstrate this. So using the techniques that we're, we're developing and you know, that they have previously demonstrated to um, place these arrays, we're, we're pretty confident that we should be able to get at least hand regions um, of feedback. What I want to talk about today are some potential future projects in this space, in the sensory BCI space. Um, one of these is a project that one of Baloo's current students is looking at, um, and two other projects are things that I've been thinking about that are sort of motivated by my previous work in peripheral nerve stimulation, um, but I think could potentially be benefited by bringing into the BCI space. 
Um, and so these are very preliminary ideas, um, the, the second two are. So I, I welcome your feedback in whether you think these are interesting or, or worthwhile to pursue. Um, you know, these are things that I'm thinking about writing proposals for, so I welcome any feedback you have there as well. Um, so for each of these, I'm going to talk about, you know, what the motivating factor was in the peripheral nerve side and then kind of how it relates to now this BCI space that we're getting into when it comes to sensation. Uh, so the first idea is the is integration of multiple percept locations. Um, so in, in the previous work in, in peripheral nerve stem, uh, we could stimulate through individual contacts in an extra neural cup electrode that's placed in, along the nerves of someone with upper limb amputation. Um, and so we put in stimulation, then we can have them report the location that they feel the sensation. Um, but then if we want to give them information that's relevant for grasp, let's say, let's say a pinch grasp, we might want to give them you know, a thumb sensation and, a, and an index finger sensation simultaneously so that they know, you know whether they're positioning their grasp appropriately over an object and how much force they're applying to that object. Um, so we might think that then if we apply stimulation through each of these um, contacts that evoke these individual sensations, and if we do it so that the fields don't interact electrically in the nerve, then we might just get a simple combination of these two sensation locations. But anecdotally, what we've seen in the peripheral nerve is that it's not always so simple. Sometimes we get different locations that didn't seem to occur in the original <laughs> individual contact cases. Sometimes they might be in slightly different areas. And this is not, we believe, not due to electrical field interaction. So the question is, what is causing this? Is, you know, where along the pathway is this happening? So what we can do now with our BCI system and what one of Baloo's students, Bree Hutchison, is planning to look at is the same sort of idea of integration of these multiple percept locations. Does this happen with ICMS? So if we stimulate the brain through multiple contacts, do we similarly get these sorts of effects of like nonlinear combinations or are they a more simple additive effect? If we see differences between peripheral nerve stimulation and ICMS, this could help us understand perhaps the location or the role of different subcortical structures in this integration step. The other benefit that we can do with this system is in with individuals with sensory incomplete um, SCI, so someone who still has some of their sensory pathway intact, we can actually put in peripheral inputs through mechanical touch and then record in the brain to see what's happening. And this might help us understand what are the neural representations of this integrative um, pathway and is, is that something we can use then to leverage and develop better peripheral nerve stimulation paradigms or even better ICMS paradigms um, to convey information about grasp that involves multiple uh, locations that are activated simultaneously. So this is something that um, Brie Hutchison is working on and she's actually giving an NEC talk on Friday. So I'm gonna direct you guys to go there at 9 a.m. And, and see her more in detailed <laughs> uh, talk about this. Okay, so the second two topics I wanna to talk about are, are much more preliminary. These are future ideas, but are again motivated by some of the work that we've been doing in the past with peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, so the second one is looking at the dimensionality of sensation that can be produced by ICMS. Um, and this is in, in regards to a dimension of perception called quality. And so the quality of a sensation is its type or modality. So you could think about in normal touch when you're interacting with a surface, you might get information about the, uh, the texture of that surface or some you know, other surface properties of that object. And this really helps us for object interaction and for exploration of the world. Um, so we've done a, a study previously, or several studies actually, in peripheral nerve stimulation with amputee participants in collaboration with um, Dustin Tyler's group. And in this particular study, we looked at the effect of stimulation pulse frequency on quality. And here's some results from that study. So for each of these different qualitative descriptors, uh, we had people report for different stimulation conditions which descriptors applied to that particular stimulus. And here a color indicates um, the percentage of trials that they reported you know, that they believe that that stimulus contained that particular qualitative descriptor. Um, so what was exciting about this study is that it seemed that stimulation frequency modulated sensation quality. Um, we saw certain words that appeared at higher frequencies and certain words that appeared more prevalently at lower frequencies. And also interestingly, we have some smooth transitions. You know, for example, if you look at the touch row, that as you increase frequency, there seems to be this smooth transition where the proportion of times that they uh, reported feeling touch increased. But what's interesting also about this is that it's a very complex space. You know, this is a multi-dimensional <laughs> uh, quality percept. It's complex. Um, it's a large space and it's difficult to 
to encompass. Actually, we studied 30 different descriptors. These are just a subset of the ones that we actually studied. Um, so if we want to convey specific sensation qualities to someone and, and you know, again, so can, to give them information about the textures they're feeling or something about the objects they're feeling, we need to be able to give specific qualities at command. Like we want to be able to give them a rough sensation or give them a buzzing sensation when we want to. So in order to do that, and because this is so complex, we need to understand the dimensionality of the space. Um, so what I mean by dimensionality is essentially how many axes are needed to fully define the space you're talking about. So what's interesting about quality and respond, you know, in, in contrast to other dimensions like the intensity of the percept is that it's multidimensional actually across sensory systems. If you think about the visual system, for example, um, quality is the color. And so that's a three-dimensional space. So you could have, you know, black on one corner and white on the other corner, and you can kind of lay out different colors in this 3D space. But touch quality is also very similar. So if we think about the texture space, we also have this kind of three-dimensional representation that um, others have previously seen um, to, to convey the relationships among different textures. Um, and actually in, in natural touch is a little bit more complicated than this because this is just one subspace of somatosensory perception. There's also temperature subspaces and perhaps um, like pain subspaces. So this is just the texture subspace of quality. Um, but the question is, you know, do we, can we get the same kind of dimensionality from ICMS or even from PNS? You know, can we, can we independently modulate a sensory percept along each of these axes independently of the other two or three um, dimensions? Um, and if we don't have the same dimensionality, what is the dimensionality? Is it lower? Is it higher? How do we control each of those dimensions? And then if we think about, you know, these dimensions, are they the same between peripheral nerve stimulation and ICMS? Um, that might help us understand when we might want to use a certain kind of neural interface or another in a certain patient population. Um, if we can have better control over certain perceptual correlates with PNS versus ICMS, that might help us make these decisions um, in certain systems. And also I think understanding this quality space will help us um, develop better stimulation paradigms to, you know, again, move along these axes and to control each of these different dimensions individually to potentially provide more quality information and potentially address the naturalness issue. And the third uh, project that I think is the most exciting is uh, the development of a closed loop peripheral nerve stimulation controller. Um, so this particular project is actually um, focused on improving peripheral nerve stimulation techniques rather than BCI techniques, but it's using that BCI system as a testbed, as a platform to help us understand the implications of peripheral nerve stimulation. So I think this goes into the ethical uh, piece as well, because in this particular project, it wouldn't be necessarily benefiting people with tetraplegia, but it could be using that as a platform to gain insights that could help other patient populations that would be utilizing peripheral nerve stimulation. Okay, so a little bit of context for this project and the backdrop in the peripheral nerve side um, is that this built out of a DARPA program called the Intelligent Neural Interfaces Program. And the goal of this program is to use artificial intelligence and actually to develop new artificial intelligence techniques that they called third wave AI um, to enhance nerve stimulation encoding. So the basic idea is if you have a touch input, um, a, any simple touch input will have a number of different parameters that define it. So it might have the size of, of you know, how, much, how much of your finger is contacting a surface, it, you know, where is it contacting your, your body, you know, the intensity or the depth that you are applying to that surface, um, you know, the texture information, et cetera. And traditional stimulation encoders, especially that, that are used in APT um, in prosthetics, um, typically only attempt to modulate one of these parameters. We would just focus on the most common is looking at intensity or depth. So we're just going to try to convey that over time using stimulation, but ignore the others. And the goal of this program was to say, could we build a stimulation controller that would be able to put out information to control all of these dimensions of touch with a neural interface? Um, you know, simultaneously, but also controlling them independently. Um, but the issue here is that the controller actually operates on neurons directly versus, um, you know, this, this touch input is, is more like the skin space. And so we, the goal of this program is to kind of develop that translation between the two, the translation layer, I guess, between the touch input and the stimulation controller. So we're able to actually um, activate the neurons in an appropriate way. So I wanted to show you uh, one of the tools that we've built in this program um, to help us understand this complex space. Because when we, when we touch an object, there's a lot of neurons in our, in our skin that are activated in various ways. 
and, and at different times. And so, uh, you know, one of our goals was just trying to, trying to understand that so we can understand how to interface with those neurons with the controller. Um, so in this GUI, I think it will play. Yeah, there we go. Um, you, can, you can change the settings of the touch input. So this is for a simple kind of ramp, hold, press, release kind of input. And there I just set the, the amplitude of that of that input to be five millimeters. Um, and so what you're looking at is a probe that's applied to the index finger. Um, the, the index finger is over here on the right side that's showing kind of the layout of that finger and where all the different neurons are located. And then also what we've developed is a, a simulation to show where they are located in the peripheral nerve as well. So this is looking at like a cross section of a peripheral nerve and all the different fascicles in it. Um, and then in a second, I'm gonna show you the results, but it'll, it'll show you at the bottom plot there that's blank right now what the stimulation um, time course looks like in terms of the actual mechanical touch to the skin. And the top plot is gonna show you all the neural responses. So let me show you that. Give it a second to <laughs> go, I guess. There we go. Okay, so now the, the again, the stimulus time course is on the bottom and then a top is all the different neural responses. And actually what this GUI does, which I think is pretty cool, is you can, you can kind of scroll through it and see actually where the neurons are located in the finger and where they're located in the nerve at different time points and also what types of neurons they are because there's different types of afferents that are involved. Um, so this is a tool that we developed. I think it's going to be helpful for our project. It's been helpful for our project and could potentially be helpful for many others. So if you're interested in learning more about this, let me know. Um, but I think it could help us interpret neural signals essentially and, and develop strategies of stimulation. Um, so going back to kind of our overall approach, we had, um, you know, these three feed forward pieces to develop the stimulation controller to go to a neural interface. And then this kind of back end piece that we've been developing in this program involves um, two different models. Um, one is a mechanical model that predicts the neural responses to normal touch. And another is an electrical model that predicts as the neural response to electrical stimulation. And these two are working together to extract features that then will be fed into the neural stimulation controller to predict how to actually control those specific neurons. With the stimulation. Um, and so this is some work that a uh, master student, um, Tanya Tetrani, is working on. Um, and this is our, our current version of the controller. Um, and the top left is that neural response to normal touch that we're trying to replicate. And then in the top right is what the controller output uh, is, is doing to that neural response. So the goal of the controller is to get as close as possible to the, the natural touch output that's on the left. And so this is as close as we can get on the right. And the controller parameters on a pulse by pulse basis are shown on the bottom two plots, the pulse width and the pulse amplitude, um, you know, pulse width on the left and pulse amplitude on the right. And what's interesting about this controller that I think is different from prior ones is that it's actually a, a multi-contact controller. Um, you know, other, other people have looked into field steering where, you know, you can have multiple contacts on simultaneously to try to activate different groups of neurons. But what we're doing here is on a pulse by pulse basis, the controller is selecting which contact to select as well as what parameters to apply to that contact to get the most similar uh, neural population that you know from the to try to mimic the original touch input and so it's interesting that this controller selects multiple contacts throughout this one second simple kind of ramp and hold um, touch input we see you know contact 13 is active contact 2 contact 1 contact three, all at different times to, to get specific populations. So this is something novel and I think is exciting um, that we'd like to um, you know, continue the development of. And ultimately what we want to do is take this controller and actually put it in humans. Um, this current project is all computational, but if we put it into humans, we could actually look at the perceptual response and see how using this kind of multi-contact but interleaved controller compares to using traditional um, controllers that are used in sensory feedback now for amputees. Um, and so we've also had to make some assumptions because this is a computational project about, you know, what constitutes neural error. And so we can actually test those assumptions by looking at the perceptual response. Okay, so now where the BCI system comes in is that this is all still feed forward. We, yeah, we have this back end that's doing modeling and trying to predict, you know, what the right neural responses are, but it's still feed forward and there's no control loop. Well, potentially the BCI system could enable us to do in someone with sensory incomplete tetraplegia is we could actually have a real control loop where we could take a cortical recording from someone who's getting these peripheral nerve stimulation inputs in, in, in their nerves through, through the FES electrodes, record in the brain those signals getting there, and then use that information to feed back to the controller to change it in real time to push the neural, the cortical activity towards one direction or another. If we had an idea of what that cortical activity should look like, we could actually 
update the peripheral nerve stimulation activity and try to make that cortical activity occur. Um, so I think this, this could be really exciting and I don't think has ever been attempted before for peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, it you know, enables like true closed loop control that we can't do now and could potentially help us develop better, um, more informative peripheral nerve stimulation encoders and potentially also better uh, intracortical stimulation uh, techniques. Um, but again, this kind of comes back to the idea of, you know, it's on, we could potentially use peripheral nerve stimulation in a person with tetraplegia to provide sensory feedback, but the idea is that most people would probably be using the ICMS. So if we, if we did this sort of study, you know, in someone with tetraplegia, it's not necessarily directly benefiting them, but it could benefit other individuals potentially with amputation or with other neurological deficits that could be using peripheral nerve stimulation or potentially even people who have chronic pain, right? But it's, you know, using this kind of platform approach to investigate these sorts of questions. Um, so that's kind of the idea there. Um, so again, these are the three projects I, I mentioned. I, I'm happy to hear any input you have on the, the last two if you think they're worthwhile projects. I'd, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my lab and my collaborators at, at CASE um, and the University of Chicago. Um, and I also, I threw up here, Baloo, I went ahead and put one slide together about our potential <laughs> other grant that we're working on. I don't know if you want me to talk about this at all, but I threw this up here to also see the discussion. It, it's about other ways of using this platform technology to investigate scientific questions. If it's of interest to people, sure. Um, you know, I think for our grant, the ethics issue is it's probably one of the biggest ones I'm most nervous about. So I was hoping that we could definitely talk about that for sure. Um, I mean, maybe I'll just throw in one more thing in there. When you, you mentioned, Emily, the ethics of using, of uh, doing investigations that will benefit other people and not the persons enrolled in the study. You know, I think maybe even going a step further, you know, the ethics of doing investigations that have no immediate neuroprosthetic benefit at all. Right. I mean, that's actually, you know, this brain initiative is you know, one that we're submitting to. It specifically says that these are not BCI neuroprosthetic grants. They're supposed to be basic science grants focused on understanding underlying brain function. You know, most of the studies that are submitted to this call are, you know, they're in collaboration with epilepsy monitoring units where people are already receiving, you know, um, ECOG or depth electrodes um, for clinical care um, and investigating questions about, you know, motor representation or speech or the like. You know, in our, in our proposal, you know, we are hoping to leverage persons already, in, persons already implanted with these intracortical microelectrodes, you know, one person at Hopkins, one person here at Case, but then we are also specifically requesting funding to um, to recruit two new people, you know, one Hopkins and one year case. And so that's where the ethical question really becomes a little bit murky, potentially. You know, that we would specifically be recruiting people into the study to investigate scientific questions, you know, that Emily has described and others, you know, related to sensory motor learning and sensory motor representation. And knowing that there will be an ethicist reviewing this, um, you know, we spoke with Jim Nat, who runs, helps run the Brain Initiative, and he's like, that is, like one of the first points of discussion um, in the review, in the study section. So we were told we should really think about that before submitting. Yeah. So the the grant that Bully was alluding to is is uh, I tried to encapsulate it here in this slide, but the idea is that we want to understand the role of primary somatosensory cortex directly in both attention and sensory motor learning. Um, but this is kind of we're trying to tease apart the influences of this cortical structure, somatosensory cortex versus like subcortical structures like the thalamus and the cerebellum, which are part of this processing pathway, but maybe aren't directly involved in these, right? So there have been studies like, well, cerebellum is, is probably directly involved in sensory motor learning, but the question is like, to what extent, if we exclude these subcortical processes and go directly into primary somatic sensory cortex, do we still see attentional effects and, and learning effects that we would normally see in, in natural touch? So again, this, this doesn't really have any direct benefit. I mean, I think it could inform future BCI studies, but it doesn't really have any direct benefit to BCI right now. It's just kind of getting more information about the system. So can I uh, jump in uh, uh, just for yeah. a, a, a moment? It, it, this comes at a perfect time when you talk about uh, um, 
Brain Initiative in Essex because I'm just preparing for a study section right now um, for the first time for the Brain Initiative for myself that uh, um, they want, I'm a discussant on a number of five protocols and I'm I'm not a reviewer, but a discussant and they've given sort of as broad a, a, a stroke as you could to saying, please look for the neuroethics issues, which <laughs> which is a little bit disconcerting because it, it, it gives whichever... Uh, uh, ethicists they choose sort of a pretty broad um, um, uh, mandate to, to look for things or a pet project or um, but I think there, 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 there's some general uh, um, thoughts that it could be helpful I think um, the first is that if there's no benefit the ethicist is going to go immediately to what additional risk burden um, additional compensation for their effort and time are you uh, are you going to uh, provide them? Uh, the second thing will be for those already enrolled, is there a coercive way of getting them to get involved? Uh, they may feel uh, grateful to you for the collaboration, particularly with the BCI. Uh, my observation is that there's times when the uh, participant in the research um, really becomes a collaborator with you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you have a relationship that's positive in that um, they may feel um, uh, comfortable with you, but they may also feel indebted to you, if, particularly if they're, they're seeing some uh, benefit. Uh, Leigh um, Hochberg um, gave a, a, a very nice presentation and said in COVID, um, uh, he's at um, he, BrainGate guy. Uh, he, he said that one of his, uh, his observations from an ethics viewpoint was that in COVID, a uh, number of his implants um, felt that they really lost something because they had built a relationship with their um, research associates, the research coordinators that would visit and create contact. And for folks who can be isolated, this was one way that part of the benefit was that breaking of isolation. So when they lost some of that because of COVID, uh, that was actually a, uh, a benefit that was removed. Mm -hmm. uh, so the... Um, the extra two people that you're going to implant, uh, are they going to be implanted for an additional study also or just for this study? Well, so that's the thing, right? So they are recruited, they will be recruited under existing IDEs, right? So okay, yep. one, one at Hopkins, one here, you know, and the IDEs themselves specify safety as a primary endpoint it's a device safety study. Yeah. Um, we have to be very careful how we write the grant or the emphasis we put on the grant because the grant is not a device grant. It is a basic science grant. Yeah. Right. So, but I mean, they will be engaged in the other studies that these participants typically are involved in. Okay. Um, you know, whenever I um, I, I see, um, and again, I'm. I, very simple understanding of all this that you just presented. Um, but when I think of, of sensation, uh, you very nicely move to quality, which I also think of maybe as experience. And then experience, how does that translate to behavior or perhaps uh, motivation or other things? So the ethicist is very likely going to jump to worries of um, uh, inducing pain and pleasure and creating complex behaviors that uh, that may be unwanted as a harm. And so you wanna make sure if that is uh, completely science fiction and unrealistic, that you may wanna sort of offset that and, and make sure you minimize the limit. Uh, maybe my, this is influenced, I, I had a chance to talk to Carl Saab earlier this week and you know that, that transition from acute pain to chronic pain is uh, fascinating in the clinical setting. You know, what, what differentiates not I don't know whether it's in sensation, but I understand it to be the complex behavioral responses, neuro something, right? So you may have a um, uh, ethicist like myself who has a limited understanding that will say, well, these are already pretty challenged uh, individuals with tetraplegia. Are you going to, do you have a chance of inducing some type of uh, pain that in fact is going to create like a phantom limb or uh, you know something like this. You want to assuage their, their fears or address it, whether this can 
induce a, a psychogenic uh, psychological uh, stress response uh, um, you know and and given you know Robert Heath's work early in the last century uh, with pleasure there's also maybe somebody who knows their history and will will go after those kinds of uh, uh, you know it, are, are you going to induce something that is uh, uh, unwanted in terms of pleasure um, those are a couple of things and, and you know, I mean your, your primary issue that you raised was the one of uh, studying people who aren't going to get a benefit, or at least it's not aimed towards them. Um, I, I would mitigate that in some way in that studying these kinds of sensory things in these brains, um, I don't, I, I'm not convinced you can preclude that these will have some um, connection with, with, uh, with future understanding of the tetraplegic brain that will in fact uh, lead it. It's not that you uh, you're studying something on their brain that will never um, that that isn't valid. Or it strikes me that it would surprise me if you if you didn't say we have no immediate um, connection. They're not going to take the next step, but we will share and have all this this data available for how their brain works available to other creative researchers who could put it to use. Anything of that uh, resonate with you or um, find interesting or helpful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think your points about the creating chronic pain states and inducing phantom limbs is very interesting. I wouldn't have thought to talk about that, but um, you know, there have been other studies of human brain stimulation, and none of them. I think some of them have reported that the sensations can become painful, right? We, we know this in the peripheral nerve too. If we stimulate at very high levels, <laughs> it can become painful. So, you know, we, we know what regions of, of the different parameters to avoid. Um, and, and I think they've seen the same thing with brain stimulation. I don't, I haven't seen anything reported about kind of inducing some sort of maladaptive brain state. Um, but the issues of phantom limbs, I think are, are very interesting because I kind of question whether that's possible in someone who has a real limb, but I, I kind of believe it might be possible. I think this is a kind of a really fascinating <laughs> uh, thing to think about of, you know, what is the role of the person's current body representation that is deafferented um, in their experience of these sensations. So I think, I think it's a really fascinating area of work. <laughs> you know, I wonder, I mean, I don't know if this is a good argument, but I think that our technology is so limited. It's not, it's not advanced enough to be able to deliberately create those, you know, um, those unwanted percepts, right? Because, you know, right now, you know, the state of the art is basically, you know, applying varying stimulation parameters and people report percepts ranging from tingling to unnatural to something which resembles natural in terms of touch. And I mean, Emily, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's about the current state of the art, right? So, no? I think, people I think people could report unpleasant sensations. I think like people have reported like things like shock and like electrical. And I mean, the pleasantness yeah. aspect is kind of subjective as well as to like, you know, would you call tingling or electrical to be unpleasant or pleasant? That can sometimes be like individual variability in that particular designation. But I think people could report unpleasant percepts that they so personally I, don't like or enjoy. <laughs> I, I, I think um, you give a lovely and convincing answer um, that you should anticipate their, their concern about this. And um, the response of this technology has not shown this and it's not at a level we expect, but we will, cr we will record all the data that we'll be able to detect it if it happened to happen, even if, uh, even if we don't expect it, we will watch to make sure there's no untoward effect. Right, mm -hmm. anticipate something that uh, that they 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 might worry about. Say it's it's really not a reason we're seeing, but we'll we'll be very vigilant uh, about the the potential harms. So I have one question for Emily. The the, the you know the stimulation. Um, you, you, you presented a case where you were looking at the, at the relationship between what happens out in the periphery and the brain responses so that you could adjust the, you know, the feedback somehow. That, effect, that, that essentially requires somebody to have a non-complete 
sensory uh, in injury. Is that right? Yeah, I just yeah, want to make they, sure. They would have to be sensory incomplete, yes. Yeah, and that seems to be, at least in the people we've uh, been sort of screening in the last few years, it seems to be fairly common. Mm -hmm. so, but it is, but it is a, a, an interesting uh, is, issue uh, that, that, you know, they have to be sensory incomplete. And so it gives you the opportunity to actually record the sensation and, and, and to provide some as well, right? The, this, the cortical sensory responses and then, and then insert some to see, to see if it, uh, if it helps. I, I, maybe that's not much of a question, but I just wanted to make, you know, I wanted to understand that it requires the incomplete. Right. And that, I think you're talking about like the controller development that I kind of presented at the end there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah the idea is that we would take these paradigms that we've developed already based on models, potentially test them in somebody with tetraplegia <laughs> that's sensory incomplete, put those in, in the peripheral cuffs that are going to be in already for FES and then record in the brain what signals get there. Now, I, I acknowledge not all the signals will necessarily get there because even if they're incomplete, they may still have partial sensory damage. But the signals that do get there, we can record and try to use that information to help us nudge the peripheral stimulation controller in one direction or another to potentially get different types of signals in the brain. Yeah, the same question probably arises in some of this work that, uh, you know, Bree Hutchinson and Tanya Alfaro are doing. Emily talked about a little bit, where we're trying to apply mechanical stimulation, you know, uh, in the periphery and then do, do doing cortical recordings. You know, these require people who have some sense, you know, who are sensory incomplete. And one of the questions that arose in our discussions early on was, is it ethical to implant an electrode inside somatosensory cortex in somebody who, who has intact sensation? Right, I mean, there is a potential partially question. Partially intact. Partially intact, thank you, sorry. Partially intact sensation. Um, I'll say right off the bat that the one, two, three people who have had um, ICMS sense medicine sensory cortex at our you know, colleagues' institutions, they have had some partially intact sensation. And you know, one of them at least has had significantly intact sensation. Um, on the one hand, there are questions about whether or, not, whether or not that was ethically justifiable. On the other hand, we've seen little to no uh, chronic damage or loss to their, to their sensation as a result of implanting in, in this in, in, in somatosensory cortex. So those questions will probably come up as well in, in our view. Right? If somebody has some level of sensation and you implant an electrode in there, what happens if you they lose it as a direct result of the implantation. You know, is it ethical to do that? Again, fortunately, we haven't seen that in the three people or so that have been implanted across the country, but it is something which I know comes up in conversations all the time. And, and it is important to these folks to maintain that, uh, that um, little bit that they have left for functioning. Is that correct or not? Well, so that's the question, right? Like, I mean, one question that arose, or somebody posited the question, what happens if they were to lose it? Is it, is it a functional loss? Often, you know, or is it sometimes, you know, like for example, you could imagine needing to change positions to avoid bed sores, right? So it could be a functional loss. Um, alternatively, it could just be a personal loss, which is not any less important. Um, you know, I think the, you know, the, the take or the angle that we were hoping to take is that, you know, just looking at the three people who've received these implants previously, there has not been reported any chronic loss of the sensation that they have remained. I don't know, I don't know if there are other thoughts in relation to that. I think also the thing about sensation is it's, it, I don't know if people recognize its benefits necessarily. So I think if you ask someone, if you lost sensation as a result of this, would you care? They might say no, but I don't know if they really would mean that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a, the, the point that's, that swirls around is that uh, people aren't gonna believe you if you say, well, we just have really good informed consent and and people will, uh, will you know, they'll know what they're getting into. But it's one of those things that is 
you know, maybe unknowable that we still ask people to take a leap of faith. Um, you know, it, it strengthens your case that it hasn't happened in the, uh, the, um, um, the three cases, uh, but it's a, a real possibility is what I hear that our theoretical possibility that, um, and for no uh, functional benefit uh, to these, these folks, right? No, I think they, so if they were in a BCI study, there would be functional benefit to them because even though they have some sensation, it's usually partial and it may be better or worse on various regions of their limb. And so if we gave them implants in the brain, yes, they have some pathways that are still intact, but others may not be. And so we could provide that, that information for those other regions of the body or the other regions of the hand in that case. So there is supplementary information, I think that could benefit them. So that, uh, that, that study has a stronger, uh, I have a stronger argument to say, you can't guarantee any benefit, it's research, you, but uh, there is a chance that both the data that you'll get will help people like this person, and there's a, a hope that perhaps you can uh, benefit from this uh, sensory. So that's a, a, um, an easier sell than the earlier uh, project. And I'll, I'll just say that I think the expectation is that they will get benefit. It's not that they, and we can't, it's like Blue said, it's a safety study it, it, uh, from the FDA's perspective, from a funding and from a, maybe an IRB perspective. I think, you know, it, we're hoping that, that we can provide some benefit to these people. The other, the other thing that I'll just sort of amend slightly, Paul, is that, you know, the, the issue of, of people that have some in, in, intact sensation they actually give us information that we cannot get from people that do not you know it's not just people like them it's people from whom we will never get this information because maybe they have complete loss of sensation and this will give us sort of a give it us i'm not doing this work directly but you know the bigger project it'll give it'll give some guy you know a path to how to do the sensory uh, stimulation is that a fair statement? Yeah. Yes, so so it, it makes for a stronger argument that folks with injuries like theirs, but who have in fact um, complete sensory loss, um, they could contribute meaningfully to betterment of science around those, uh, those folks, which is still their population, but their population who are worse off or yes. more mm -hmm. complete. So, you know, I, I think I, I would frame it not as a different population, but just a population whose consequences of the injury are um, more severe. So you can help both those and that uniquely places them in a, a place. So I, I think that's a, a nice uh, um, additional argument. Okay. Thank you, that's incredibly helpful. Why don't we get some, let's poke some holes in their science instead of just, uh, they're, they're trying to dodge the science questions with the ethics. I'm just kidding, Paul, but. Uh, Go for it. Oh, Please not me. Please. I'm, I'm I, I think it's fantastic. You know? <laughs> I'm a little too close to uh, poke holes right now, but. Maybe, well, I'll ask anyway. I'll, I'll be the a devil's advocate here. So, you know, the, the, the electrode arrays that you're going to put in are quite small and a really tiny fraction of one part of the somatosensory system. So is that really, I mean, you could say, well, we're not going to damage it too bad because we're only a small part of, I mean, literally, I don't know how these, are these arrays four by four, the split ones? I, I don't remember. Uh, these are eight by eights. So there's 64 channels. As I meant the dimensions, four millimeters by four millimeters. Are they small? Oh, I think they're about three by three. Yeah, they're very small. Um, you know, we'll, will you be able to get the information you need from, I mean, it's really a, a, a sampling question. So in terms of somatosensory cortex, like our understanding, just based on some of the mapping studies that have been done previously, is that, um, you know, our areas of interest are essentially the fingertips, right? And so the way they're arranged is they're arranged just right along um, the sulcus. And so our goal is to, you know, we have these 
you know, eight by eight, 64 channel square arrays that we want basically just to line right along the sulcus, which according to, you know, uh, mapping studies which, which have been done by, you know, our colleagues and operators seem to encompass uh, the fingertips, you know, all, all five fingers on a given hand, which would be most uh, beneficial for us. So we think at least that we should be able to collect all the relevant information in terms of grasping, particularly precision grasping. It'd be nice to get some information about palmar contact as well, um, but the fingertips are what's most important. We think we can get that coverage with the arrays um, that, we're, that, that we're going to implant. Yeah, at least at least of the first three digits, which are our target. Um, somebody asked a question: What is the typical functional lifetime of these brain electrodes these days? That's an interesting qualifier. These days, um, for those who don't know, there's a history of these electrodes having you know, mm -hmm. different lifespans of failure, uh, of, um, ranging from you know you could ask somebody this is six months up until several years. Um, three, four years ago, the company that makes these arrays, BlackRock, changed their manufacturing processes to supposedly enhance the, you know, enhance the quality of the arrays. Um, but, you know, because of, uh, you know, there are biological responses to implanting these arrays, you know, these stiff arrays into a non-stiff medium, i.e. the brain, um, you know, you could argue that the arrays last anywhere from one to five years. Clearly there's, you know, for recording, clearly there is a, a decrease in the number of electrodes, sorry, the number of neurons that are recorded over a multi-year span. Um, it's not clear what happens when you're actually regularly applying electrical current through these arrays, whether or not that'll have an effect on the, you know, biological response and your ability to record neurons um, in a longer time span. Um, but that's something which remains to be seen. I actually think, um, I haven't read these studies directly, but I think Bree, your student, um, found a couple of studies that actually stimulation seems to preserve the electrodes. It actually makes their longevity better in terms of their capabilities. Yeah, yeah I, I've asked people that, that work in this area if it's like, you know, in the old days when you take your car out to blow the crud out of the carburetor. And they, they're just aghast at that, at that concept. But I, there is some evidence that it does help to, to pass current. Um, it was also suggested that because stimulation is forced to be charged balance, that actually could be beneficial because when you're recording, charge is mostly going one way versus when you're stimulating, it goes, it's like forced to be balanced, both cathode and anode. Yeah, the, I, I just will say from my, from my limited experience in this area that the, these electrodes have lasted longer in recent years than they did in the past. And it, you know, it wasn't a tremendous problem with our previous participant, but those are anecdotal numbers at this point. It's not really a, you know, a complete study. They're not intended to be forever i'll put it that way we don't we don't expect them. i mean it would be unrealistic to consider that they'll last forever no question Ellen, well, um maybe i missed it but what sort of sensing um at the fingertip will be used what sort of sensors at the fingertip will you use? so initially in the initial studies we're basically looking at characterization right so we you know, so Bree is um, working with an undergrad student to develop essentially um, a tactor type system that would actually apply, you know, um, that would actually apply localized indentation of the fingertips. Um, you know, but in a but in a closed loop, you know, FES system, you know, that's actually a really good question. So um, initially, you know, a very simple but not elegant approach would be to use some sort of sensor-based glove with, you know, some sort of, um, you know, glorified load cells, right, on the fingertips, right? That's not an elegant solution. Um, several years ago, John Rogers from Northwestern University was an MP seminar speaker, and he developed flexible, uh, flexible electronics. Um, and I had a long conversation with him about the possibility of developing implanted flexible electronics and he didn't seem that interested, um, but the idea 
if this were a reasonable idea at all, would basically be to develop a network of implantable, you know, force transducers. Um, uh, he wasn't, he normally does not, he mostly does non-invasive approaches to that. Although I've heard recently that he may be getting into invasive flexible sensors for the very reason of being able to do something like this. Um, that would be my holy grail. Um, I think that'd be the most elegant solution. Clearly that is more invasive and there are concerns, you know, in that regard. Um, but until then, um, if, if we had an actual system using, you know, if we had an actual bi-directional system, it would have to be something non-invasive, like a glove approach. So. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of, some of the studies may also involve like virtual reality kind of utilizations of the system, in which case we could have signals from the virtual reality system feed into the ICMS mm -hmm. controller. Yeah, th th those are great options. I mean, I, I met a guy at EMBC, who um, is at Watson, IBM Watson, and he had this device with no, with for a completely different purpose. It was a, it was, it was a machine learning powered um, fingernail, like nail polish attached thing, strain gauges. And he was using it for just so you could like write like on any surface, handwriting. But I was talking to him about potentially using it as a, a force sensor because it doesn't obstruct the finger pad and, and, and it, you know, it can, it can, it's just, he just uses nail polish. Um, it was, it was for like a, a Parkinson's related um, drug to, to check tremors, but that flopped. And so he was like, you know, if you have a use for it, let me know. Um, I, I think that might be interesting because it's all like kind of a system on a chip and Bluetooth and it looked really elegant. <clears throat> Hmm. So that before. Who, who's that? What was the person's name? Do you remember? Uh, I have to dig it up, but he, he's at IBM Watson Labs. So, you know, reputable electrical engineering outfit, but they basically made something that I wasn't. I'll, I'll reach out because I keep, you know, I was thinking of for, for something we're doing with, with Emily and, and this might be another application for it. Um, that'd be interesting. Yeah, let me dig up the the person's name and I'll share it with you. It might be a nice intermediate solution, not quite invasive, but also not quite as bulky. You're on mute, Baloo. Sorry. Uh, so one of the things that, you know, we thought about, which um, probably would not work is doing some interneural recordings, right? So in people who have some of intact sensation, perhaps the intraneural signals um, could be useful in terms of you know, measuring, you know, force transduction, right? But those are really, really noisy, is my understanding. I think Dominique Duran has, has done these, but those are really, really noisy and not really um, useful. But for somebody who had, you know, that could be an option. I don't know what sort of interface would be most useful for doing that. But my understanding is that even just basic single recordings and no, you know, of single internal recordings just, are just not that useful. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Heath put some, uh, put a message here in the chat about some previous work that he and, and Dr. Krager, Krago and I don't, I don't know this person, Ignagni um, mm -hmm. did where I think they recorded from, they said for chaining corpuscles. Um, I remember looking into that briefly when we were writing the BG plus proposal up last year. Um, it, it seemed like it, it worked in those situations, but it may be uh, restricted to like really specific as I think they were doing like slip detection and maybe really specific to being able to do that particular um, type of information. Can I say something? Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is, this is uh, older work in which we detected uh, the thumb and we instrumented uh, the thumb and index finger uh, using uh, cuff electrodes and predominantly getting it out of piscinium and corpuscles, but we could get slip detection and then we could uh, put that directly into an FES system to uh, prevent uh, a person dropping an object they were holding. But there is probably enough information in, from those peripheral uh, sensors, natural sensors, below the level of the spinal injury that you could send that information up 
uh, to the sensory cortex as well. Uh, it probably is not sufficient enough uh, to generate phantoms. Uh, at, and I don't know whether you'd have to map it to the, the thumb part of the homunculus of the sensory uh, strip. But there are lots of uh, peripheral signals uh, being generated in, in these patients, and they, use, they could use it uh, pretty well. Same thing, this, this is what led in part to our, uh, our work with the amputees, uh, because people could then do a little bit of uh, frontal lobe processing of those peripheral signals, and they would know where they were coming from. Uh, just to suggest that natural sensors uh, could have a role here rather than trying to develop implantable uh, pressure or strain sensors. Uh, let me ask uh, Baloo and Emily, can you record uh, sensory uh, signals using those cuffs? I know they're not really intended for recording. I mean, there might be a future uh, development. I mean, so I, I think this, this kind of goes to what Blue was saying earlier. I, I believe that I, my understanding was that Dominique Durand had um, used these same kinds of cuffs for recording previously and had a lot of noise issues up that high, um, you know, because you know, there's a lot of signals going by and there's going to be muscle activity too. Um, I think it's possible. Yeah, I, I don't think with the final electrodes that, that we're putting in for stimulation purposes that we can record those kinds of, of signals. So yeah, I remember this very well, Mike. It was uh, the the Danish group, right? Yeah, with uh, Thomas Sinkauer. Yeah. Thomas Sinkauer, and I brought the patient over here from their lab, where yeah. they put the small cuff electrodes in it. They weren't uh, they weren't real sophisticated uh, cuffs. I think they were just uh, uh, bipolar recording cuffs, but they were small, and we wrapped them around the peripheral nerves, and the uh, restriction to an anatomic area was what let the patient know that this was the thumb. It could have come from anywhere as far as uh, where we re-injected the signal. And in the closed loop, uh, they, they weren't really feeling the signal. They were looking at their hand and they were seeing that they didn't drop things. So they were, they were doing a, almost a visual uh, bridge there. Um, Dr. Keith, in those studies, you were implanting on the digital nerves, correct? It wasn't, it wasn't, it was like distal to the wrist. Is that correct? That's correct. There was, a, there was a solar, a partial solar eclipse the day that the testing went on. That's what I remember most because I went outside with a couple of the Danish guys. They wanted to look at it. Yeah. Anyway. That's why it worked. It was an eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, there's a paper about it as, as one of the ways of doing sensory feedback. The, the jump here, of course, is that you can probably generate phantoms uh, based on some of those, or you can condition the patient to appreciate their phantoms. And that might uh, turn into, for instance, oh, that's my hand. And uh, they could do a little better in performing tasks. Certainly, patients who have sensory feedback from the area of the prosthesis or the hand do better than those who don't have sensory feedback. Mm -hmm. In our DARPA BG Plus proposal, we were working with Doug Weber and posited the idea of using, you know, dorsal ganglia direct recordings. Um, yeah, DARPA didn't go for that too much. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe another long shot or a long-term possibility. Yeah, we could plan a spinal cord stimulation electrodes in there and record from them and yeah. use that as a seek signal. Well, keep trying, you know. That, that wasn't strange enough for them, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Ironically, what got funded actually wasn't that strange. It's weird. Yeah. That's a whole other. In fact, not strange at all. You have to figure out what movies these guys are watching. I think it's The Matrix, and they're, they're looking for a one-plug connection for everything for brain access. Sorry, I, I, I divert. I don't know who FWM is, but FWM That's Fred Montague. Oh, okay. Hey, Fred. Um, uh, question about Hopkins helping us place electrodes. So we are collaborating with 
investigators at Hopkins, you know, who actually implanted these electrodes in their participant, I think three years ago. And we're, when we're trying to recreate some of their um, approaches for, you know, mapping the fingertips. You know, they actually place bilateral electrodes or electrodes in both hemispheres. And at least reportedly were able to get fingertip, fingertip sensation on both hands. Um, so, you know, we're trying to recreate some of that work. You know, we're, you know, they're actually on this U01 brain initiative that we're hoping to submit as well. Um, so then they've been a great partner actually thus far. Okay, any other questions? We're kind of over time, I think. Um, but we're, you know, don't let them off the hook so easy. I thought this was to be a friendly discussion. I'm over just, over I'm just hassling you in a particular, uh, Baloo. Okay, well, last call. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining our first Tuesday this month. Uh, thanks to our presenters for uh, having a, uh, stimulating some really great uh, discussion. I see what yeah. you did there, Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it accidentally, but I recognized it after I was finished. Um, so uh, join us next month at the beginning here. There was dates but in people, but I don't, I don't remember them. November 3rd and it's Carl Saab. Okay, November 3rd, Carl Saab, who was mentioned by Paul, new investigator here in town. And I saw Mike Moffat is for December, is that right? Yes, he is. Okay. And then, um, but next Thursday, we have our MP seminar for October as well. So um, make sure you join us at, at it's three o'clock on Thursday. Okay. And the NP seminar is Silvestro Micera. So anyone's interested in sensation, you should listen to his talk because he is a major uh, player in the field of sensation. You know, we're taking advantage of, uh, of uh, you know, we, we're handed lemons and we're making lemonade and we're having international people on the MP seminar mm -hmm. remotely at this point. So I think it'll be a really uh, fun, uh, you know, interesting seminar. Can I ask a quick question about that, Cheryl? So I think I nominally invited him, but is there anything to be done? Are there talks and meetings? Are there meetings he's having with different people? Um, we have not set up any meetings for him. Um, that is something that we can do. And we were planning on doing that moving forward. So if people do want to meet with him, um, they can just send a note to either me or, or you and we can put a schedule together for him. Yes. Okay. And then we also have been creating virtual tours of the labs, um, which we will, I, I think I already sent him that link um, so he can kind of take a look at what we have going on in the FES Center and the lab overviews. And that way um, he'll get an idea of um, individual labs and research programs. Nice. Okay. Everyone have a great uh, rest of the day and the rest of the week, and uh, we'll see you next month. You too. All right. You too. Thanks for the input. Bye. Yep. Bye. Hey, Paul. Um, if Paul. Yes. Uh, maybe at some point we could chat, me and Emily, if you're willing to kind of talk about this year one. You know, great. maybe early this week, we'd love to get your input and have you or I don't know the other person you mentioned formally listed on. Yeah, Lauren, Lauren Sankri. So we're, we're both uh, doing neuroethics at the clinic here. Uh, Lauren uh, has a brain grant, has done reviews, or uh, had a brain fellowship. Uh, the only, well, the first neuroethics fellowship that they offered. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then she came on staff this year. So she's very nicely situated to, uh, to sort of help with these kinds of things also. Wonderful. So, um, mm -hmm. go ahead. so ne ne next week when I'm on consult service, but I'm also uh, have Wednesday and Thursday covered because I'm at study section virtually, of oh, course. Right. Um, but uh, but my reviews will be done by then. So uh, what what kind of timeline are, is best for you? Um, well, the grant's due in about a month. Um, yeah. we've been you know, talking with our collaborators for, you know, several weeks trying to put this together. The ethics angle was, you know, we met with Jim Matt, Jim Matt 
last Friday. And that's when we started thinking about how do we really address some of these concerns. So, um, you know, you know it may be, be more helpful after uh, Wednesday because uh, I'll get a sense of what some, you know, the, the, the tough thing about ethics is that it is really uneven of mm -hmm. who they get to, to look at. I, I mean, I'd love to say that, um, that all my colleagues are research ethics people and know a little bit about neuroscience, uh, but it's it's really a wild card who they draw on. We have a very, we don't have a really deep pool of people. So um, I, I, of course, I can't disclose anything that happens at study section, but I certainly can be aware of the global kinds of issues mm -hmm. of uh, that are pet projects, pet peeves of some people. And Lauren and I can sort of give you sort of a 10,000 foot view of, uh, of some of those. Um, some of the things will depend on the specific details. Mm -hmm. So sure. you know, maybe that a brief conversation first and then a, a little more in-depth one the following week. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe what would be helpful is maybe not next week because if you're if you're busy, but every Monday we meet with our full group, our collaborators at Baylor and, and Johns Hopkins in Chicago. So maybe um, if, if it's possible for you to kind of join that call one, one of these weeks um, and kind of talk to the whole team um, that'd be sure. useful for uh, all of us. And, uh, what, what time does it happen on Mondays? Uh, noon. noon. Okay. That, that uh, I should, uh, should work, uh, work nicely. So, um, we'll send yes. you the invitation and when you're able to join. Yeah, Great. we can go ahead and send it. I mean, if you happen to be free this week, you can come, but, um, you know, otherwise we can maybe have you in a couple of weeks. Okay. And available. I guess we don't have a ton of time to put it together. No, no, no. <laughs> I, mean, I, I understand it's, it's close and we can, uh, we can meet, uh, um, you know, find a time to meet briefly uh, if, if you uh, if you want. Um, I was just thinking that uh, after Wednesday. Now, Baylor also has a group of neuroethics people. Uh, there, there are only a few centers that really have people doing uh, uh, neuroethics stuff. Some Harvard, uh, Baylor, uh, Stanford, uh, University of Washington, Seattle. Um, th those would be where um and then there's a few smattered across the uh the, the the country but um okay so hopefully before we meet we can get you like a specific aims page and we have to Perfect. address some of the ethics questions a little bit in there um okay. and just to give you just like a broad you know broad brush strokes overview and then we can have a more detailed discussion i did actually sit on a brain initiative um study section in january of this past year and i you know so i hear what you're saying about sort of it being an uneven discussion about the ethics. I definitely observed that. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So uh, can I share the, that uh, specific games page with Lauren Sankri, the, uh, the other neuroethicist? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I'll invite her to, uh, to the Monday meetings as well, if she'd be willing to attend. Um, and you think that'd be helpful for her? Yep, no, I think it, and, and it gives us a sense of who might be best positioned to uh, provide you feedback to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Good. No, this is, this is great. Awesome. Yeah, and I think, you know, throughout the project, even it would be great to have neuroethicists on board to understand, you know, if we have to make decisions and tough calls, what are we doing? <laughs> sure, and, I, and I, your quality kind of stuff uh, falls right into values and choices and perception that uh, that's fascinating. So there may even be a small little bit of neuroethics research that we can do as well. Yeah. In the qualitative. That'd be great. Awesome. So. Good. Cool. Thanks. Hope you guys Thanks have a good evening. Thanks, Emily. Um, mm -hmm. I think it went well. <laughs> hey.